Thank you. So I'm um, here on behalf of Scotland to speak about our participation in the 100,000 genomes. And um, I think um, I thought it'd be useful to, to just start with a bit of context. The Scottish Genomes Project is a, is a Scottish wide collaboration, which was started by Tim Aitman and Andrew Biankin. Um, one leading on rare diseases and one on cancer. And that actually started, um, I'm not, I mean, my impression is it slightly predated the conception of the 100,000 project. Um, and it, it arose following major investment by the universities of Edinburgh and Glasgow in um, genome capability sequencing equipment. And the what happened with that project was that we were able to make an alliance between that's what was going to be a Scottish centred project with the 100,000 to get additional benefit um, for for everybody. Um, so the, the Scottish Genomes project itself is a much wider project that included cohort sequencing of um, specific birth cohorts of um, isolated populations of specific disease groups, um, a large focus on cancer from Glasgow, but then the bit I'm going to speak about, which I was the chief investigator for, which was about NHS Scotland taking part in 100,000 genomes to improve diagnosis for rare disease. And that's the element I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about any of the other bits. So just for context, genetic services in NHS Scotland are spread across the country because the people are spread across the country. Scotland has about 8% of the UK population, but it covers about a third of the geogra geographical area. So we have real rurality issues to deal with and remoteness um, when we're delivering our health services. The health services are delivered through 14 regional NHS boards and an additional seven special NHS boards, which include a centralised commissioning service called um, National Services, or um, sometimes called NSDs, you see at the bottom of the page. So our the regional genetic services are based in the teaching hospitals that are the tertiary referral centres for the country. And they are, each centre has in uh, within it a laboratory but also a clinical genetics team that work extremely closely together. The genetics laboratories are funded centrally through national services and managed as a consortium and that consortium way of working to deliver e equitable high quality healthcare to the patient when they need it. That's been running for 32 years so we're pretty good at working together in, in a collaborative um, but actually managed way. And we have two parallel groups now, one that focuses on germline disease and one that focuses on molecular pathology. And clinical genetic services, as I say, work closely, but are actually separately funded by the regional health boards. What we try to do is have a once for all Scotland approach to testing. And if I would put that as having the right test for the right patient at the right time. And I think it's helpful maybe for context to tell you that Scotland has um, certainly historically been an early adopter of genetics and healthcare. We've had, when we had benchmarking across the UK, our testing rates were generally higher than in, in most disease groups than other areas in the UK. And we have a higher proportion of mainstreaming as again, until recently. So, um, that's the context in which we entered into the work on the 100,000. Um, the funding for the, the genomics, working with genomic, and you'll, you, you know, you, it's Genomics England, so NHS Scotland taking part with England had to be separately funded by the MRC and the CSO, and I had to write a grant with Tim to get that funding in to begin with. Um, further to that, in when the funding wrap for that ran out in 2019, we applied for some additional funding to maintain 
the ability to have a genomics pipeline and to continue to work with, with Genomics England. And that was funded through what we called a bridge, because the idea was would bridge us till a, a, a formal Scottish strategy on, on genomics would be funded. Um, unfortunately, COVID came along and the progress of our major Scottish strategy has been slightly derailed. So in the way we've built another bridge to cross the Firth of Forth in, in Scotland, we are building another bridge now to um, until we can get a major investment on, on genomics and in as embedded within the basic healthcare. So if thinking about our participation then, um, so what have we done? So Scotland was funded to do a thousand genomes in the first wave of phase one, and we did an additional 300 for rare diseases in phase two. And that those we followed the same eligibility criteria for access in the rare disease element as the rest of the UK. So basically our access to genomes was only about a, third, a sixth of that um, of cases in England. So what you'll see in our data is cases that are selected on the basis of um, you know, the, the highly selected, really, really needy patients. Um, because that was that was that that's what we had available, and that the other patients went on and had panel tests. Um, next slide. Oh, sorry, it's me. <laughs> um, so this infographic is is just to demonstrate how the the different services um, share the data. So you can see here we have. Um, Aberdeen and NHS Grampian where I'm based so we provide services for genetics patients if you draw a line from sort of where my mouse is across to here basically everything above there and Shetland has fallen off the top so it's a huge area that we cover with a combination we've got three island health boards we have to serve <coughs> so and but because the health the, the, the hospital is embedded to provide health care in those regions as part of its day job. Um, we have sample flows, we have information flows, we have clinic systems and record sharing established between those boards. Likewise, um, Dundee and Tayside do, do kind of this blob, Edinburgh does this bit, and then Glasgow does this bit. And you can see that the project was very much a collaboration, not just between the, the four NHS laboratories, but each is closely embedded with their local university, which is important, not just for research, but also for education. Um, and the data then, what we did was we collected the samples in the local clinics, the patients were phenotyped there, and de-identified patient data was sent to the Genomics England data center using a, a version of the Open Clinica data capture phenotyping system. And we then samples were sent to for rare disease to the High Seek X facility in Edinburgh. And that's the bit we're talking about specifically today. And then that data was sequenced in a, in a batched way and shared <coughs> with Hingston and the Genomics England systems run through the variant callers there. And then the data was displayed to the clinical scientists for the relevant patient um, back in the local labs. And then work, they work with the local clinician to interpret that data to work out which were um, very, you know, variants of importance and validate and report them. So how was NHS Scotland's participation different from the 100,000? We had to write a separate consent and data governance process because even the legal systems between Scotland and England differ. And this was considered as a research study, um, which has led to a lot of paperwork, but probably less paperwork than if we'd had to set it up, not as a research study at that stage. Um, so only de-identified data has flowed south and the cipher as to who's, which patient is which has been held in the clinical genetics centres. Um, and um, so the, the same data that was 
interpreted locally in, in the English um, genetic medicine centres, that's the same that our, our um, lab scientists had access to, pulled that together with the clinical data, and then we did the validation and reporting. And then the reports went to patients as part of NHS care, just as they did in NHS England. Because we have less patients in the project, that has perhaps allowed us to do a little more in-depth analysis at this stage um, of where ha things have been useful and um, you know what, what the gains have been. But just for context, before we were taking part in the 100K, we had single gene tests, just gene panels, microarrays, and we had access to trio-based exome testing through the DDD project. That's the, the deciphering developmental delay project based out of the Sanger. So we that was that was what the standard offering was. As phase two started, we've also had some um, a lot more panel testing pulled down from exomes, and we have um, our trio-based whole exome sequencing pipeline available now that that mirrors the DDD process. And that's become now the standard care for severe developmental disorders. Um, and that's there as a, as a holding position until we know where the, um, the genomics review will, will take us. We are also creating a, an NHS Scotland genomics data store, which is for um, panel test data and that sort of thing. Um, and it's the first time we've been allowed to share genomics have a system for sharing even just variant data between the labs. Um, so it's been a major governance improvement to, to put that in place, as well as simply um, allowing us to use cloud storage. And then the genomes again have been within the research framework that we've talked about. So so where, where are we now? So we don't have any data yet um, in terms of the outcomes of the, the 108 in phase two. So I'm just going to talk about the first families that took part in phase one and the outcomes for those. So you can see we're just shy of 400 families um, took part to make our thousand genomes. From those of um, all of them, own just um, just over 250 had what, what were called by the software as the presence of tier one and two variants. And then we all, so that's sort of hot ones to have a, have a good look at, but those only translated into a positive test result for um, the, the number um, 69 of the patients. Um, that actually, oh, that so 69 led to a new diagnosis that could be clinically reported. Um, so some of those may, you know, in future turn out to be real, that, that some of the gap might in future turn out to be real, but it's only 69 could be reported according to the current paradigms. Since, since we reported those, we've gone back and done a, a a deep, what we call a deep dive analysis, which uses that Examizer tool that um, Mark mentioned earlier, but it's also looking for rare variants that co-segregate and match the mode of inheritance um, for the variants. And that has allowed us to make an additional 16 diagnoses. So when I was looking earlier, basically an 18% from tier one and two has increased by 4% to a total of 22% diagnostic rate. So just to break that down a little bit more, um, if we look at the categories that we have, um, you'll see that this, this is the same as the, the pattern that Mark showed earlier. Um, I think you'll note that the majority of our diagnoses were um, the best hit rate, it looks like it's growth disorders, but that was only two patients. But you can see that in um, ciliopathies, the diagnostic rate was good. Um, congenital anomaly syndromes and um, neuro, this is where the rest of intellectual disability sits in neurology and also eye disorders 
and skeletal disorders. So kind of what, what you might expect. Something that I think is interesting is that our yield in cardiovascular disorders was relatively low. And I think that's because we had good comprehensive panel testing in place. So the, it's worth also commenting that we have, in addition to those diagnoses, we have made a further two diagnoses from researchers working in that research space, making a diagnosis. Now, in fact, one of those, those research diagnoses was also phoned back to us by the DDD study because the patient was in both. Um, but that's just proof to us that there will be additional year through researchers looking at that data and that space. And I think that's very important for the families. I thought it was helpful to just reflect about the effects of prior exome testing. On the left here, you can see we've, we've got the patients that had intellectual disability, which is the majority of our participants. And you can see that of those that had already been in that exome sequencing study, the DDD study, the additional diagnosis achieved through taking part in, in, in gel was, was only, was only um, in two cases. And in fact, um, those two probands have since been reported back to us through DDD as well. Um, so I'm going to just take you through the reason why, what we think um, was going on there. But you can see that the majority of these had not had prior exome, trio based exome testing, and we achieved a similar rate of diagnosis there to, to what DDD has been achieving. So over, over um, so I think it's 37%. And then in the intellectual disability, without inter intellectual disability category, of those that have developmental disorders, then the yield has been reasonably high, but again, it's only four cases. And in those without developmental delay, without malformations, the yield has been just a bit less than 20%. So still for those patients, making a big difference. Um, but you can see that intellectual disability as a selection criteria, and if you, if you only have a limited number of genomes to do, that might be where you might start. So like, um, like in England, we've been doing a health economic evaluation and it's very much work in progress. Mandy Ryan at the University of Aberdeen is, is leading this element. Um, I'm just going to give you a couple of snippets from, from that analysis. So we costed the whole genome sequencing pathway from a single centre using our processes of working with NHS England based on the pricing that was in place at the start of the project. Now, obviously those prices have, have fallen since the project started, but I think it gives us, gives us a ballpark. And the, to us, the cost, the cost for a trio to take part in the project comes out at £6,600 a case. Um, now we're currently validating that result um, and by looking at other sites, we're comparing to the trio based exome pathway. And this is what we call full economic cost. So that's anything from taking the sample through to the clinician time examining the results. Now, I think we are shaving costs off at many stages in the pathway, not just in this, the, um, the, the fact that going forwards that the sequencing cost might be um, might change, but more that like the data processing costs might change. But still, um, you know, there is a substantial cost in evaluating the patients and putting the data into the system, but also in working with the variants when they come out the other end. And at the moment, we still need expert analysis with expert clinicians looking through the data. We're getting faster at it the more we do, but still um, each, it is a detailed individual expert process, but as we'll hear later, you know, that makes a huge, huge difference to patients. We've costed the diagnostic odyssey for some of our patients, and on average, we found it was about £1,841 a case. So there's been an argument before that, uh, that, that not doing the test you would have done would pay for the genome. Well, that's not the case in our hands, but as Mark says, there are far broader benefits 
to be gained and we're going in the, mo the middle of, of costing that in detail as Sarah has done but also um, we've looked at other ways that you can measure the value to patients of, take, of having a genome result and what we've shown is that the standard ways that health economists measure value are not the right ones to capture it in this regard and we're in the middle of a process of patient interviews to devise a tool that will allow us to, to go back to every participant in our project and ask them about how they value the outcome of their sequencing. So going forwards, um, we're how, what's, what's the plans for whole genome sequencing in Scotland? We currently have to do a formal options appraisal to inform the review that will decide on ongoing funding for any kind of genomics, and that includes exomes, it includes genomes, and in fact, um, just, just the general uplift in testing that's going on in genetics. So that's all under review at the moment. Um, the key considerations about what would be selected will be about regulation, about patient data sharing, about accreditation, about ease of data collection and transfer, and also the importance of, of research use of the data. But I think it's worth just saying that we don't have committed ongoing funding at present for exomes and genomes like is in place in England. Um, but we certainly have an aim to have, have the right test for the right patient at the right time going forward so that the indications in the national test directory can be served. Um, I think I, what I take from our data is that the most important thing that our final system gives us is it's going to be really important that we can go back and reanalyze our data. The, the gap that we've seen in those additional tier three analyses was due to new genes being implicated in a phenotype and added to panels, or it was due to gene agnostic analysis making us realize that actually perhaps we'd looked at the wrong panel of genes. And it's, it's the ability and the affordability of being able to go back and review data, I think will really add um, value to these projects. And I think international data sharing is going to be absolutely key to that. Um, thank you very much. And I just want to finish by acknowledging, again, you know, even within Scotland, the huge number of people that have taken part. Um, I think we often forget the additional time and effort and dedication of the NHS teams who've had to do this as well as doing the, the, the testing they used to do. They've, they've loved doing, but doing it, but let, don't, we mustn't get this wrong. Looking at a genome result takes time but looking at a panel result doesn't. Our national services colleagues have been fantastic at getting the funding for us and helping us iron out the, the enormous bureaucracy of expanding to, 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 to do this type of testing and in working with Genomics England. And huge thanks to Genomics England for taking us on their journey and to the CSO, MRC and Scottish Government for funding of our project. But my, and also, also all the researchers, in particular to Tim Aitman and Andrew Biankin, um, for setting up the Genomes Project. And um, I want particularly today to thank Lynn Many and Windings Humphreys, who have been the running running the management of um, pulling the thing together for us. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.